Church. We are continuing to look at scripture through the metaphor of pottery. Today we wrap up the series looking at the final process of making pottery, firing the clay into its final transformed state. Today is Father's Day. I would like to thank all the fathers in our church. We are glad you are worshiping with us this morning. Join us in prayer as we dedicate this time to God. Dear God, on this special Father's Day Sunday, we'd like to thank you, our Heavenly Father, and all of the wonderful fathers in our community. Without your love and, nour and nourishment, our congregation would not be the same. In your son's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Father's Day. Today's scripture reading is from Genesis chapter 21 verses 8 through 21. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever, whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of this child. 
And as she sat, the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The motif of pottery is found in various places in our scriptures. Paul uses pottery analogies several times in his writing. In his second letter to the Corinthians church, he writes that faith can be fragile. A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7-18. through 18. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with scripture, I believe and so I spoke. We also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus, and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, boys and girls. Today in our scripture passage, we hear about the story of a father and two mothers and two sons. It's a complicated story and the mothers end up disagreeing about the children and they send one away. And as the mother and the little boy are out in the wilderness, the mother gets very sad and is upset and cries out to God. And God hears her and God answers her prayer and God cares for her and her little boy. And he grows up to form a great nation. Sometimes when we're hurting or sad or upset, we wonder, where is God? We say God is always with us, but sometimes it's hard to feel God's presence. We know, though, that God loves us and God cares for us just like the mother in the story cared for her son and just like God cared for and loved and protected them. This story and this idea of God loving and caring for us reminds me of a poem. It's a poem about footprints in the sand. Have you been to the beach and watched as you made indentations in the sand and near footprints you could see them? especially if the sand is wet. It's fun to watch and see them as you walk down the beach. Well, in this poem, the man is talking to God and he notices that throughout his life, he saw two sets of footprints, one that were his and one that were God's. But then he noticed that during the most difficult and sad days in his life, there was only one set of footprints. And he asked God, he said, why did you leave me during those difficult times? And God looks at the man and he said, my child, it was then that I carried you. The man thought God had left him, but God was actually carrying him 
through the difficult times and never leaving his side. That's what God did in our story. That's what God does for us. When we're hurting, we know that God loves us and God is carrying us, taking care of us. What a wonderful comfort that is to us. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you that you are always with us. Thank you that you never leave us and that we can always count on your love. Thank you for the reminder that you love and protect your children and that just like the footprints in the sand, in our difficult and sad and hard days, you are carrying us. May we not forget. May we remember and be grateful and share that love with others. For we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye.
Please join me in prayer. O oh, loving God, we come to you with hearts that are full, full of thanksgiving for the joys of life, the love of family and friends, for beautiful spring mornings with bird songs and blue skies, for gentle breezes that remind us that you are as near to us as our own breath. Thank you for blessing us far beyond our deserving. But, oh, dear Father, when we open our eyes to the world around us, we see so many of our brothers and sisters with hearts full of pain and sorrow, worry and despair, and our hearts are broken. Take our hearts, O oh God, make them tender and humble, full of compassion and love, so that you can use us and the gifts of our tithes and offerings to bring healing and peace in a world that is broken and hurting. But even in a time when our world seems to be turning on its head, we're reminded that there's a season for everything, even rejoicing. And so today, we offer a special prayer of blessing and thanksgiving for two of our college graduates, Graham Brooks and Taryn Ballard. We celebrate their accomplishments and take heart in knowing that a bright future lies ahead of them. Dear God, as they step out into the irresistible future, may they go with the assurance that you will always be with them, loving them and sustaining them. And so may we all. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Redeemer, giver of hope and joy. Amen.
About 25 years ago, Karen and I were in choir practice at Parkway Baptist Church in Duluth, Georgia. We pulled out a new anthem to rehearse that evening, Psalm 86. All of us were sight reading, so we really were focused on our music. Midway through the first verse, Karen burst into tears. If you know Karen well, you're aware that she hardly ever cries. For her to succumb to tears, something extreme have to, has to have occurred. The poor minister of music didn't quite know how to respond. No one else did either. I was on the back row and she was on the front. I didn't know what was going on until some of her friends turned and looked at me with questioning looks of concern on their faces. We put that anthem away and did not sing it again for several weeks. And then, only after Karen had gone to our minister of music and told him that she was fine, that we could sing it whenever he wanted us to. The words of the anthem come directly from the pen of King David. Psalm 86 is a lament. David is crying out to God in the midst of his pain and his rising grief. That night at choir practice, the emotions that Karen had been holding in check over years of infertility burst through the surface as we sang, Hear my voice, O Lord, when I cry. Hear my prayer from when I cry from the lowly place. In your mercy, Lord, let me stay. Hear my voice, O Lord, when I pray. Today I'm continuing the pottery theme that I've used as illustrations for the past few weeks. While the analogy works well for some parts of this conversation today, it's forced or even an inappropriate analogy in other parts of our discussion. Today the title of my sermon message is Fired. Typically the final stage in making pottery is to put the dried pieces of pottery into a kiln, an oven made for extremely high heat to transform the dried mud into stone. My kiln will heat to almost 2400 degrees. The process of heating the clay and glaze materials to such high heat causes transformations to occur in the body of the clay. In the heat, some elements of the clay body melt. Some chemicals separate into various elements, combining to form new components or fusing with neighboring elements to go from a porous to a solid, to a non-porous body. I was shocked in college when I discovered that to master pottery, I had to learn chemistry. I went into art for a reason and certainly not to learn the sciences. I've talked about my friend Hadi Abbas, ceramics professor at University of Central Florida, many times in the past couple of weeks, and I would like for you to meet him. A few years ago, Hadi built an Anagama wood kiln in his backyard in Orlando. At least once per year, he and his students from classes fire the kiln. The process takes about two weeks. <music> historical aspect of the design that I built and that was in 1997 I had moved to Florida in 1990 and I experienced my first hurricane season and I saw all these trees in central Florida and I decided wow that would be opportunity to build a wood kiln and use all this wood Loading the kiln, it takes approximately two to three days. So when we, um, later on the firing, we'll start putting wood down and through these holes. And anything in here, the wood when it comes in, can hit stuff. So all this is usually pretty sturdy stuff. Certain parts placed uh, 
adjacent to each other, uh, sometimes a smaller piece sets besides a bigger piece, and where the flame hit these pieces, in a way uh, you can say that you are painting with fire. This morning we're talking about personal and corporate transformation. For many people, such transformation comes during or after an experience of deep pain. I think talking about pain can be dangerous. It, it prompts asking some really hard questions of Scripture, of God, of, of ourselves, and of our community of faith. I don't pretend to have all of the answers. Folks much smarter than me, who have much more life experience, are still wrestling with the ideas of God's providence. But before we start to there, there are two disclaimers I, I, about the experience of pain and suffering that I want to make sure I address directly. First, pain is personal. I cannot pretend to know, to feel, nor to understand your pain. While I can empathize with you, my empathy comes from my own experience with pain and from sitting with those I love who have been in and who have lived with pain. In that, I've come to see that while I know what hurt is, I cannot absolutely understand what another person experiences when hurting. Secondly, th there is a more pervasive and hard to understand pain that is corporate. There are those in our society and in our world who have experienced and who are experiencing pain because of who they are or because of where they live or because of their ethnicity or family that I cannot pretend to understand. There are places and communities in our world, in our nation, and in our city that are on fire with pain right now. While we can sit with, walk with, march with, and pray with them, most of us will never really understand their pain like they experience it. So today I'm treading on dangerous, tender, and raw ground. But just because the conversation is difficult does not mean we should shy away from it. As people of faith in God, we know as love, I believe we should run towards those who are in pain, not away from them. We, we are called to go and sit with those who are hurting, but more so, we are called to do what we can to alleviate the pain. If we see the cause of the pain, to fight like crazy to eliminate the cause. For we are made in the image of God. The God who walked among us as Jesus, who sought out those who were hurting with a healing touch of love, who befriended the lonely, who freed the captive, and who fed the hungry. Also this morning, let me be clear. God does not inflict us with disease, does not push us into accidents, does not kill our loved ones. Pain and death, sadly, tragically are a part of life. God no more pushes us into oncoming traffic than you as a parent would your children. That said, I, I have some questions. What does our story today about Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, and Ishmael say about God? What does it say about God when we are in pain? F further, what does it say about the way we should treat each other, the way we should respond to those we love who are in pain? What about the way we should respond to those in pain around us, even those we don't know? One thing I've come to understand through my own experiences, God and faith in God can be experienced in and through pain and hardships. In fact, that is most often where many meet God most directly, see God most clearly. There's a lot of pain in the biblical narrative. <laughs> Have you noticed? I can only imagine the pain that the characters in our story today were feeling. I, I can imagine the pain of infertility that Abraham was feeling because I've been there too. I watched Karen go through infertility pain, so I can imagine what Sarah may have felt. But I can't imagine her jealousy when Abraham went into his servant who conceived him a son. I can't imagine the guilt Sarah must have felt that she was the one who suggested it. I can only imagine the pride Hagar must have felt to be able to give Abraham this long-awaited child, holding the belief that she had provided him with an heir to the vast wealth the family possessed. 
The passage we read earlier from Corinthians is applicable today. We have this faith in fragile jars of clay. The clay used in Jesus' day was most likely earthenware. Earthenware is a low-fired red clay that is more fragile than most of the clay we use today. It's hard, but it must be handled with care. It's a commonplace clay that was used for heat-resistant pots and roof tiles. Terracotta roofs and floor tiles are earthenware. You may have seen them. Have you noticed the places where the gospel flourishes are most often places that seem to be in the midst of the deepest darkness are the most trying times? Have you noticed that it is usually among people who are struggling that the biggest revivals begin? We seem to turn to God when we are at the end of our rope, when we have nothing left to hold on to, when, when we feel like we're about to fall into the abyss. When folks are in such places, they are fragile. Just like a pot waiting to be fired or pulled from a hot kiln, the wrong touch, the wrong push, the wrong interaction can cause it to fracture or, or cause breakage that is almost impossible to fix. Such is true for people who are in pain. If we respond wrongly, if, if we respond with flippant, erroneous theological answers that can push people away from the church or, or even from God. It takes care. It takes love. It takes wisdom. So where is God in pain and transformation? I've said this before. When we are in pain, God is hurting with us. God is suffering with us. God is supporting us and encouraging us but it's often hard to see, to feel God at work because of our pain. Bob Goff is a lawyer and motivational speaker who leads seminars around the world using his Christian faith to fight sex trafficking. Recently, he tweeted, Jesus never promised to eliminate all of the chaos from our lives. He said he'd bring meaning to it. I think he's right. God can work in our lives when we're hurting and in the days of our recovery to bring meaning from the experience. God helps us in our transformation. As I mentioned last week, God is the creator and is always creating. Transformation is an act of creating. It's worth repeating. God does not force change upon us, but when we are open to, to God's creative healing power, God will begin to shape us, to reshape us. Such change is not fast. It's a process. It's a journey. Often it takes decades, years to occur. William Bridges is considered by many to be the guru of transformation. A former professor of English, he shifted to the study of transition after he walked through his wife's cancer diagnosis, fight and death. In the midst of dealing with his wife's illness, he noticed that he too was wrestling with lots of emotional and spiritual issues. He began to pay attention to his own process of transformation. His work is considered to be the baseline on which all other theories are judged. Bridges says that the process of transformation cannot be controlled by us. It is different for every individual and is dependent upon lots of factors. As a Christian, Bridges feels that there is a spiritual element to transformation, that, that God is active in the process and in some mystical way is involved in the outcome that we cannot know, see, or plan for beforehand. In his work, Bridges compares transitions to a river flowing from one place to to another. The water flowing in the river begins in one place and moves to an end that we cannot know or see. It moves across different landscapes, around various bends, over waterfalls, through narrows, into and out of ponds and lakes, and on and on it flows. One thing that I love about pottery is that in many ways it's unpredictable. I can control many aspects of making a pot. But, but I love that my pottery shows my work, my process. Often my finished pots have my tool marks, perhaps even my fingerprints on them. Pottery always shrinks as it dries, and sometimes when drying it twists or it warps. Sometimes a piece sags under its own weight as it dries, and sometimes 
if not dried slowly enough, it cracks in the bottom or, or along the joints. The, the most exciting and, and most unpredictable part of pottery is firing the ware. When placing pottery in a kiln, there's a lot that is unknown, especially when using a wood kiln where ash from the burning wood lands on the pots and, and forms a sort of glaze where it lands. The fire itself is hard to control and sometimes the rapid heat heating causes pots to crack and break and sometimes no ash lands on the pot where, where you thought one would. But, but the smoke of the wood burning form colors on the pots in unique ways. As one fires a kiln over time, one learns its personality. You learn how the ash flows and how the fire moves inside of that kiln. And as it drafts upward and out of the chimney in the back, you, you learn where to put your most prized possessions. But even then, sometimes it doesn't come out as expected. Unloading a kiln is always an adventure to see what happened during that long period of heat and fire. Last week, Nadia Bolds Weber preached a sermon on Romans 5, 1 through 5. She was preaching to the women incarcerated at the Denver Correction Facility. Late in her message, she reminds the listeners, Church, we are not a people of the inspired poster or a people of the motivational speaker. We are a people of the gospel. While in Romans, Paul speaks of a hope that does not disappoint. Let's be clear, she says. Hope is not his starting point. Suffering is. She goes on to say, this week I started to think of hope not as a starting point, but as that which is left after everything else has failed us. After we've tried optimism and virtue and piety and denial and trying harder and none of it has worked, then what is left is hope. And, and that kind of hope is an Easter hope because it's the kind of hope that is still standing after being dredged through Good Friday first. Easter hope is the kind of hope that is standing after being dredged through global pandemics and economic collapse and prison lockdowns and systematic racism first. And when it comes down to it, she says, as cynical as I am, I still want hope. I just want a hope that doesn't disappoint. I want a gritty hope. I want a hope that can only come from a God who has experienced birth and love and friendship and lef lepers and prostitutes and betrayal and suffering and death and burial and a descent into hell itself. Only a God who is born of suffering themselves can bring us any real hope of resurrection. In the days and weeks after that choir practice, Karen and I continued talking and praying about future children. Eventually, we chose adoption for expanding our family. After 12 years of marriage and 10 years of infertility struggles, we welcomed Natalie into our home. Less than six months later, we welcomed Nick. I would not want to relive those 10 years or wish them upon anyone, but I also would not trade that time for anything. It was worth it to bring Natalie and Nick into our family. Through those years, we rode the roller coaster of pain and hope, pain and hope, pain and hope. The, the hope only became visible to us because of the depths of our despair. Boltz Weber's words echo, hope is not the starting point, suffering is. We, we wrestle with pain and suffering in our changing relationship in the middle of the turmoil, and that helped to shape us. It grew us together as a couple. It, Diana Butler Bass <laughs> calls this experiential belief. She says that the path to transformation, to becoming someone different, only comes through going through the process, the stages of change. It's never instant. One thing I've come to realize is that Christianity is not a religion of absolutes. Despite what many would, may tell us, 
or despite what we might want to be the case, being a Christian, following Jesus is a process of ongoing transformation. For us, our final destination does not come in this life. We do not emerge from the waters of baptism as completed, perfected individuals. Throughout our lives, we are being transformed. The Apostle Paul says this in, Corinthian, in 2 Corinthians 3.18. All of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. As we are willing, God is continuously working with us in us, molding us, incarnationally shaping us, both from within and without. He, he is shaping us to become more and more reflective of God's image. We are, we are not being changed into an identical replica of Jesus. No, no, we, we are being molded into our perfect selves, our ideal selves, each of us individuals, each of us embodying the image of God in different ways, reflecting the fingerprints of the Creator on our lives and our actions. Like, like this teapot. We are not finished after the first, second, or third step. After the lid is added or the handles for the spout or whatever. Even the crooked spout. We are not finished until God is finished with us at the end of our lives. Often that means we will go through pain. We will go through hardship. We will go through changes. We will go through the fires. We may be broken and need to be remade. It is up to us, helped by our community of faith and our family, how we respond and how we will allow ourselves to be transformed. We are in crazy times. Many of you are in personal turmoil some of which you've shared with family and friends and some that you have kept secret. Our church is in the midst of drastic change, even before this pandemic started. Because of the social distancing, many in our faith community feel cut off from everyone else. Despite the phone calls and, and the, the FaceTime and the Zoom conversations, many folks are lonely. Some folks are on the verge of despair. And our country is in turmoil. On Friday, Jenny and I were able to participate with other clergy in the area for a prayer service for unity, supporting our black brothers and sisters. M many commentators have declared that we are at a tipping point in our country. It seems to be the perfect storm, a time when transformation must come. But what kind? Who will we emerge to be on the other side of these experiences? Who will we be when we step out of the fires that we are in? Our attitude matters. Our prayers during these days matter. The ways we align ourselves with others matters. How are you exercising your experiential belief today? How are you asking God to mold you through these events? I implore you to open yourself up to God's loving, shaping hands to be changed, to be transformed, to be made new, to be molded by the master potter into the perfect vessel intended for you to be. Pray with me, please. Hear our voice, O oh Lord, when we pray. Hear our prayer when we cry from the lowly place. In your mercy, Lord, let us stay. Hear our voice, O Lord, when we pray. God, creator, master, potter, we call to you from a place of turmoil in our world, in our church, in our lives. Hear our prayer, Lord. Mold us, make us, shape us into a more perfect reflection of your image. Give us insights, Lord, as we begin to make decisions for the future of our congregation. As we make decisions on when to come back together into our building, as we finalize our budget, as we deliberate on filling empty staff positions, as we seek direction for our congregation's mission, God, guide us personally 
as well. As each of us turn to you in the midst of this pandemic and in the midst of racial and political tensions, mold us into more perfect reflection of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Take me, hold me, use me, fill me. I give my life to the potter's hand. Call me, guide me, lead me, walk beside me. I give my life to the potter's hand.